Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road, where my guests today are Jim and Jill Kelly. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's just a pleasure to have you here. Thankful to be yeah, here. Definitely, thank you. Uh, Jim, we got to talk football to get things going. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you were the class of 83 quarterback in the draft. Um, you uh, end up taking the Buffalo Bills to four consecutive Super Bowls, 91 to 94, five invitations uh, uh, to the Pro Bowl. Um, one of, if not the best ever. Oh, well, thanks. Um, I don't know about that, but I'll take it. <laughs> I got to ask you, do you have a favorite football story? Probably one that stood out in my mind. Uh, well, not one. There's a bunch of them, but uh, my first Super Bowl uh, against the uh, New York Giants, you know, going to the first Super Bowl. And I, I can remember when I was a little boy in my backyard and in my mind, you know, going through, lead my team down the field, a pass to Lynn Swan and one to John Stallworth. Of course, growing up in a Pittsburgh Steelers yes, fan, yep. so I was Terry Bradshaw. Growing up in Pittsburgh. Yep. And so um, I, as a little boy, always dreamt about being in the NFL and lead my team in a Super Bowl. And all of a sudden, here we are, Super Bowl 25, Whitney Houston sings the national anthem. and One of the best ever, most people say. No doubt. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. And it was during the Gulf War. And I remember Steve Tasker, a good friend of mine, um, we would walk out together each and every game before the game. Us two would walk out together. And I remember walking down through, there's band members are all lined up and walking through them all. And, you know, the, of course, the row of people saying, here they come, here they come. And, you know, everybody all of a sudden starts turning around. And then you walk out into the stadium and there's already 60, 70,000 people already there. I mean, we usually walk out. There's usually 15,000 maybe for warm-ups. Mm -hmm. But when you walk out in the Super Bowl, you walk out, there's like 60,000 already there, and then the flash bulbs going off. Yeah. And to finally get your team to that game. And for me, was the last two minutes of the game. Here I am, reminiscing about all oh, what I you know, dreamt about as a little boy, leading my team down the field at the end of a Super Bowl. And it came to reality. Mm. Here it was a little over two minutes ago in the Super Bowl 25. I'm the quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. We need a field goal to win the game. March him down the field and, you know, pass to Andre Reid, a great catch by Keith McKellar, draw by Thurman Thomas for 15 yards, another pass to, I don't know, Andre Reid again, a scramble up the middle by me for, I think, maybe one yard. <laughs> 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 I don't know how far it was, but <clears throat> to be honest with you, get him in field goal range and thinking, we're going to win a Super Bowl and having all the confidence in the world with Scott Norwood because he was one of the main reasons we got to that point. And to have that field goal go wide right, but still the memories I had throughout my career, that one sticks out because it was the first time I was able to lead our team to a Super Bowl, even though we didn't win them, but being proud to say I'm a Buffalo Bill. Even although he's had all those concussions and all of his health issues, he still remembers specific things. Like that was a monumental moment in his life was yeah. the first Super Bowl. And it's so, so cool. I got, I, got to, I got to remember what she just said, the things I remember, because I've been using that concussion and uh, <laughs> chemotherapy a lot. Of, I don't remember you saying that, honey. <laughs> you got to be cautious on how detailed you exactly. are. Exactly. Yeah, really. Speaking of memory, Jill, I want you to tell the story of how you guys met. I love sharing this part when I'm with Jim, <laughs> because he knows that, you know, whatever I say is always the real story because he forgets, right? Oh, now but, I'm forgetting. Right, now you forget, because it must not have been a monumental moment for you, but no, uh, it was at a party. I was invited by someone who knew someone who knew someone else who knew Jim, because this was during the Super Bowl years, and obviously you didn't just walk into a party at his home. He had a huge massive man bouncer at the door and you had to be either on that list or you had to know somebody who was on that list and be with them so that's and that ended you know that's how it worked out that I knew someone and we met during the night at his party and you know classic Jim he just don't started flirting with me during the night and throwing ice cubes at me and then asked me if I wanted nice way to, to flirt, get Jim. yeah wanted to get some fresh air and which I, which I politely said, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. At the end of the night, my friend and I, we went up to him and, you know, we were thanking him for the party. It was great to meet you. And he said to me, well, how do I get a hold of you? And I said, well, you don't, but it's so great to meet you. <laughs> and mind you, just to, you know, let everyone know that there was no social media. There's no possible way. I don't even have a cell phone. I'm living at my mom and dad's house. They have a house phone, you know, the, the old fashioned kind that's actually attached to the wall mm -hmm. and that you dial. So there's really no way possible that he can get a hold of me. And I left. <laughs> and so, and really, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, 
if he really wants to get together with me, if he really wants to spend time with me and get to know me, he's going to have to make the effort. And he did. Well, the only reason I did is because I found out she was dating somebody at the time. And then I thought, and then I heard she uh, broke up with him or he broke, whatever. And I'm like, huh, good opportunity. And then I found out where she worked. She was a marketing director at a, a, a country club. This is shortly after college, right? Right. I had just graduated from college right before I met him. So I, uh, I made a call and sent flowers and said, you know, just give me a chance, you know, go out to lunch with me or go to dinner. And uh, she accepted and the rest is history. You loved her green eyes. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, when she walked to this party, she had cowboy boots on, jeans, a baseball hat, and then bright green eyes. And as soon as I saw her, I was like, wow. That's I awesome. go, she can't be from Buffalo. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh and I don't mean that in the Buffalo. wrong way, but, you know, I wasn't there that long. And trust me, there's a lot of beautiful ladies in Buffalo at the time. But, you know, just how she walked in and how she was there. And I've never seen her before. It was just one of those things. And I uh, finally got the opportunity to uh, spend a little time with her. And I guess the Kelly charm worked, <laughs> <laughs> as I'll say right now. As a dad of four daughters, I appreciate how you responded. As a girl, um, a guy would want to marry, not a girl. A guy would just want to date. That's yep. right. And I think that's really uh, a Amen. good lesson for everybody to learn. And we have two daughters, too. So, yeah, oh yeah. And they've heard our story, and they know the good, the bad, the ugly. And so I'm very thankful that I believe that was a God thing, even though I didn't know God that night. But, yes. So, Amen. Proverbs talks about a child's uh, life will be known by their actions, and your children are amazing, um, Aaron and Cameron, and that they're both authors. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Cameron's written Hot Chocolate with God, a series with you, and, yes. and we're going to talk yeah. about Aaron's uh, book, too. Um, before we go uh, too much further, Jim, I really want you to describe what it means to be Kelly Tough, because this comes up a lot in your story. To make a long story short, you know, I was raised in a family of, of six boys and um, father always wanted boys. And of course, my mother wanted a big family too and they wind up having uh, six boys. And as I cut through the chase, uh, you know, being raised with that many kids in the family and really my dad wanting us to be tough. I mean, my dad was raised in an orphanage. He never knew his parents. So he automatically had to be tough being around all the nuns and the sisters and everybody there at uh, the home. He went off the Navy, met my wife, they married, they had boys, and my dad always wanted us to be tough. And uh, when we'd fall down, he'd say, get back up, you're all right, and uh, you know, don't cry. We weren't really allowed to cry when I was kids. And um, when we would shed a tear, my brothers would always be the first ones. I had three older brothers, two younger, would say, man, quit crying. If you want to cry, I'll give you something to cry about. And there were times where they beat on me. Well, they, we beat on each other. One Christmas, my dad even got us boxing gloves. You know, put us in the garage with football helmets on and let us duke it out. And all my disputes dad, settled in the ring. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, my dad was a boxer in the Navy, and uh, so he wanted all the sons to know how to protect themselves. So we all boxed, and we had a, a, a good time growing up, even though at times the competition level was always up here. Uh, my brothers always wanted to beat me, and my older brothers, my younger brothers, and so the competition was always there. But the good thing about it was how he taught us to be tough all the way through, not only physically tough, but mentally tough. And he always taught us that, you know, we're all going to go through things in our life. It's what you do about it. And my dad worked in the steel mills. My dad went around selling knives and just a lot of different things to help support six boys. And uh, he said, it's what you do about it. Never feel sorry for yourself. He said, make something of yourselves. And uh, he always wanted us, even though he pushed us along the way, he always wanted us to be self-motivated. He didn't want to have to tell us every single day to get out there and practice basketball practice baseball, practice football. He said, you're never going to make it if you have to rely on me to tell you every day to get out there and work out. And it got to a point where he didn't need to tell us anymore. We wanted to do it because we wanted to be there. We wanted to be proud and want our parents to be proud of us. Well, we got to get this love story uh, going. Uh, do you remember the night you proposed at your restaurant and what you did? Um, it was a buddy of mine's restaurant, which we, as players, and even more the other players would go to, after the Buffalo Bills game, and then they would go to my house afterwards. Well, I became in love with the place. I mean, the people were so unbelievable. Ilya DePaulo's and the father uh, is just such a kumba. He was, he was <laughs> That's I know what you're saying. Oh, yeah, he was so into it. But the thing is, I wanted to do something special. 
So, uh, you know, there's all so many things to go through a guy's mind. Oh, how do I do it? I just don't want to give her a ring. I just don't want to get on one knee. How am I going to do all these things? And um, I did forget some of it, which I was reminded of uh, before that I'd wind up getting on my knee, which I don't remember, but I'm sure I did. <laughs> if she says I did, I you guess did. I did. But she always liked desserts, and so did I. So what I did was I took the wedding ring, my engagement ring, and I put it in the middle of the cake, and I had somebody bring out the cake, the waitress bring out the cake, and lay it in front of her with, on it said, will you marry me? And a picture of the ring um, in the middle of the cake. And then I told her to open her eyes because it was a surprise. She opened her eyes, she looked down, and she just, Whoa! You know? <laughs> well, it took her a while to say yes. And I said, hello, excuse me. What, you going to answer the question? And she goes, of course. And then, of course, we hugged. And, and at that time, Jim is one of the most eligible bachelors in the world. So it's kind of a, I would assume, sort of a fairy tale time for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And not only that, I was from Western New York. And certainly, it wasn't like he hadn't met many girls from all over. And so... Yes, it was a fairy tale, and our wedding was absolutely amazing. Yeah. It was, everything was perfect, which is interesting because it was all of those things that you hope it would be, and then even our our um, honeymoon in Italy, and which is where our second child was conceived, and so it, it's just, it was amazing. So you have Erin Marie, beautiful Erin Marie, and uh, we're going to talk more about her when we talk about her book. Um, but that second child is Hunter Boy James Kelly. And I'd like you to just talk about um, what it was like the first few months uh, until you learn about his diagnosis. Well, I'll jump in if that's okay. I went to one of my doctor's appointments without Jim because we had decided, well, we decided we were not going to find out the sex of our second child, that it was going to be a surprise. And it just so happened that Jim wasn't able to come with me on one of those appointments and she asked me that question. She <laughs> said, do you want to know? Oh, my. <sighs> and I couldn't help it. And so I found out. And you kept it a secret. And I kept time. it a secret. And this was in the, in the midst of him deciding to retire from the NFL, from the Buffalo Bills, which is, I, I can't even fathom what he was going through. This is a game he lived and died for. Right. He had done since he was a little boy. I mean, he still signs number 12 on people's cards, mm -hmm. you know? So this was his part of his identity, ultimately. And so I knew that he was going through that, and yet I kept the secret. Because I thought, mm, maybe I should tell him, because that will soften up this blow of retiring. But I was like, nope, I'm going to keep the secret. And amazingly enough, couldn't have written the story any better on his birthday. February 14th. Yes, Valentine's, Valentine's Day, Day yeah. 1997, my water breaks. And I know what's coming, and he has no idea. Oh. <laughs> and, I'm so picking, awesome. and, so, and so I pick it up from there. Yes. So I go to the hospital, and of course, I, we've been to Lamaz classes before, and uh, so I had an idea how to, you know, get her ready and get her excited. And <laughs> come on, come on. Okay. It's like it's a game. It's like, come on, exactly. like, come on, like push. Coach it ain't Kelly. that hard, sweetie. <laughs> just kidding out there, just kidding. Yes. I know, I would never want to do it, but... Uh, and, of course, as Hunter was coming out, which I did not know if it was going to be Hunter or what the name of the baby is going to be, but uh, uh, he comes out, and the first thing I do is look right between the legs. For the gender. I, I want to see, is it a boy? Because, I mean, think about it. It's my birthday. Mm. And I'm thinking, would it be awesome to have a son born on my birthday? And, of course, when he came out, and I even prepped my mind beforehand, if it was a boy, the script was already done, written, the game plan was already done. My brother Danny, my little brother Danny, had a son born 11 days before that on February 3rd. So I automatically, in my mind, thought, wow, it, how could this be any core? That is, my, my son would wear number 12 after Daddy. My nephew would wear number 83 after Andre Reed. Uh, one would be quarterback, the other would be receiver. And then when they played baseball, one would pitch, the other one would catch. Got all the other out. one was pitching, the other one would catch. And I would take them hunting and fishing and camping and all the things I love to do, I already had all planned. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took them home and, man, talk about a prod papa. I mean, I was just, I was ecstatic because I, everything that I ever dreamt about having boys, my brothers had boys. And, uh, you know, I was very blessed to have Aaron which to this day is somebody I look up to. She's a miracle. But to have Hunter was a dad's dream. Sure. As you can tell, it was something deep 
or mm -hmm. just, and what a beautiful gift a son is, but there was all this background story that was already, you know, written in God's heart and, yeah. Which we never knew about. No, we time. never did. No. And, we weren't believers then. No, which is amazing because, you know, you think the story, he's born on his birthday, the son he always wanted, and, you know, we have the story of a perfect story. Yes. And yet God's is so much greater, and of course we didn't know that, and yet he was going to use the suffering of Hunter and then his illness and everything to write a more beautiful story. Mm. And, that, and that's hard. It's yeah. hard God's to have that. God's only son and Yeah, only and it's, son it's hard to have that settle in mm -hmm. <clears throat> in your heart to know that, you know, you can think something is picture perfect and yet the exact opposite is ultimately yeah. what is. Yeah. And you know, finding out four months into Hunter's life, he, he started to become very irritable when we brought him home. and. We think it's colic, and so we change formulas, and so we go through all of that with the pediatrician. You know, we're talking to them all the time, saying he's just the only time he doesn't cry is when he's sleeping, which isn't often. And so we're just really wrestling with how to take care of him, and it's continuing to get worse with his care and not knowing what to do. And we eventually go in for a well visit, which when you go in for a well visit, you have expectations of certain things because that's what you do. You go in for three, six, nine, 12 month well visits. Yep, all healthy. And they do typical milestones things. And... All the milestones, they check that, they weigh you, or weigh the child and measurements and all of the shots. So that's what we're expecting. But when we're in there for that visit, the pediatrician very naturally looks at us and says, he's showing signs of cerebral palsy. Oh my. And we're like, what? I mean, we were devastated then. Mm -hmm. But to find out after more tests, that he was actually struggling with a fatal genetic disease and to, to sit in another doctor's office and have her tell us that Hunter has crab A disease, that there's no cure, there's no treatment, that he will probably not live to see his second birthday. You know, we thought CP was devastating and then we get that diagnosis when Hunter is four months old. It just wrecked our lives. What completely. went through your mind when you got told that? It is far worse than your worst nightmare, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. But then, in the midst of that, my mind is thinking because this is the only foundation that I understand at that point in time is that, you know, this is Jim Kelly's son. We have all the things that Jim is in our court. You know, we have his celebrity status, money, we have influence, we have all these things, so so it's because it's Jim Kelly's son, we can do something. We'll and that's, you know, that's just where I was at that point in time in my life. And, mm -hmm. and the beauty of that is, is that none of those things was going to be the answer. Because if they were, if he was able to do something, or if, the, if there was a cure, or if there was a treatment, I would have put my hope in those worldly things still. Um, but they weren't there for me. Mm -hmm. And that whole foundation of all those worldly things that I had put my hope in came crashing down in an instant, in a diagnosis, in a moment, you know. And I'm obviously at that point in time, I was devastated and beyond words, I can't even explain what that's like, that heartbreak. But I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that there was nothing in this world that was going to help Hunter because in that realization and seeking, then seeking after God, realizing that God is my only hope, ultimately. You have to understand my background, growing up Irish Catholic, going through all that, you know, going to church every Sunday, being an altar boy, blah, 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 going through all those and really going to church all the time. And I did pray, I mean, don't get me wrong, I still went to church and all that. But as time went on, like my senior year in college, I blow my shoulder up and I'm up, up for the Heisman Trophy and all those things that you, you think about and you dream about doing Boom, the doctors told me I would never play football again. They put three metal rods in my shoulder and said, you know, good luck, pretty much. And then being drafted by the Bills and then going to four Super Bowls in a row and not winning any of them. Mm. And then the ups and downs of going to the Super Bowl, the excitement of doing it and losing, doing that four years in a row, the excitement. And I'm serious, when you talk about a roller coaster ride. Just to get there. Mm. That has been my life. I mean, up and down and up and down. And, and then retiring from the NFL, a game that I loved and, and played and been able to take care of people I love and had a beautiful wife, a beautiful daughter, the excitement, and of course the downer of, of retiring. But then to have your son born on your birthday, Valentine's Day, the, the, the thought of where we were gonna do, what we are gonna do, everything was right there. I'm up on the top of that mountain again. 
And then to have that swept out from under me where your son's not going to make it to be two years old. And then the rock bottom again. And I'm looking, I'm saying, Lord, why? I started really getting depressed about those things. Become like, how much can one guy take? Right. Um, and really, as I said, when she seeked the Lord, I ran from the Lord. I was mad. I was mad at God. Mm -hmm. And it didn't get any better for a while. Mm -hmm. And I know that's our whole story. But I mean, as far as the, the beginning part, but it took me a long time to realize that if I didn't change, things were going to get worse. Yeah. And I didn't know how they were going to get any worse than already it was. Right. I want to get to that. I'd like you to describe what uh, Hunter's life, uh, a day in his life was like, uh, the things that you had to do and what the... Uh, Crabe leukodystrophy is actually that he can't swallow. He can't. You mentioned right. once he he never smiled, but he really did. Right. I'd like you to talk about that. Well, in, in layman's terms, obviously, because there's a lot to the disease, but ultimately, Crabe leukodystrophy affects the white matter in our brain. Our brains are made up of white and gray matter. Of course, these are things that we learned, mm -hmm. and we're still learning because there's so much to learn about the disease, even to this day. But he was missing an enzyme as part of the white matter of his brain. And because he's missing that enzyme, there's toxins that build up in his brain that ultimately deteriorate your brain, eat away at it if you, you know, to visualize that. And so it's, and as we've already mentioned, the expect, life expectancy is 14 months. Hunter, God willing, and because God is who he is and determines our days, allowed Hunter to live to be eight and a half. Mm -hmm. And his, the one thing I think that is so, I guess, because being a recovering control freak that I am. Um, no. Recovering? <laughs> <laughs> no, but one of the things that Hunter, a day in the life of Hunter taught me was that you never knew what the next moment would hold mm. with him. It was, it was always different. Yes, he had certain things that he needed. Every four hours he needed chest therapy and medications throughout the entire day and physical therapy and occupational therapy. And then he has teachers come and he it was swallow. constant. He, he, he couldn't swallow, so we, we were suctioning him all the time. We never ended up, we wasn't trached, but he was suctioned all the time and he needed oxygen. So he was on oxygen 24 hours a day and had a feeding tube because he couldn't swallow. Uh, so we, he was fed through a tube, which is, which is so interesting. Flash forward to when Jim was going through cancer, he ended up having a feeding tube, ended up needing oxygen, ended up being suctioned. I mean, just the things that Hunter went through, he went through to a certain degree. And mm -hmm. it was 24-hour care. And when I look back on all of that, there is no possible way, there's no possible way that we went through that without God, without the grace of God and the mercy of God, because it was... And then even having a third child, I don't know how that happened. Cam. I honestly, I mean, I know what it takes to happen, but I, I just don't even know. Because, Were you wondering at the time whether or not Cam would? Well, yes, because every child that we have, we have all three. Aaron is not a carrier of the disease. Jim and I both carry a gene, and we have to carry the gene in order for this disease to happen. And so we have Aaron, who is not a carrier. So she never has to worry She will about never, her. right. And Hunter, obviously, who had the disease, and then Cameron is a carrier like we are. And interestingly enough, and not to jump to Aaron, but Aaron, she said to me when she was 10 years old, she said, Mommy, she's, and she was crying, and, and I was just like, Aaron, what's wrong? And this was after Hunter had went to heaven, and I just figured, obviously, she was dealing with the grief of losing her brother. And she said, Mommy, didn't you want to know why I always wanted to be a carrier like you and daddy are. And I just, I knew that she wanted to be a carrier and she kind of felt left out, so to speak, that she was not a carrier of this gene, even though the gene is bad. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why, yeah, why, Erin? And, and I thought it was because she just wanted to be like us and she felt left out. She's mommy, I wanted to have a child like Hunter someday. I mean, that is, you know, and for her to grow up and she saw what we saw and, and God intervened, obviously, because for, for the, first year and a half of Hunter's life, we treated him like he was dying because that's what we were told. And we were, we were dying too. Mm -hmm. We were already dead. Um, and until God intervened and brought life, then we started to treat him like he was living. But Aaron and Cam's baby dolls would be Absolutely. Like they they wanted, and, and we gave them the stuff that we used for Hunter. We gave them feeding bags and they taped them to their baby, baby dolls' bellies and we gave them oxygen and they put them on the baby dolls. And that was their life. And they did not think that there was something wrong mm -hmm. with that. And I think I'm that's so, of God. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is 
it is God and that they are the girls that they are, their, their compassion. There's things that they've learned that could never have been taught. They've learned them because of having a brother and that God allowed them to go through the, what they went through at a very, in, in their most influential years, really, both of them grew up watching what it looks like to care for someone who cannot give you anything in return and yet Hunter gave right. us more than we could ever give yeah. him. Um, I want to expand on that, uh, but I, I want you to uh, talk about how Hunter was taught uh, to communicate through blinking. Mm. It was so fun. It was so cool. Uh, eventually, w after God intervened and we started treating Hunter like he was living, we did. We, we were just like, he's living. Every breath is a gift for all of us. We're going to do this thing. We're going to do life with Hunter. And so when he got to the age where most children are cognitively under, understand yes and no, so I believe he's like three or four, we taught him to blink once for yes. Because inside, like cognitively, Hunter understood everything. And once he was, we taught him and gave him, him the ability to communicate with a yes or a no, oh my goodness, that changed our ability to do things with him and to, you know, say, Hunter, do you want to play Rescue Heroes today? I mean, it was a def wow. definite blink because we knew, because obviously we knew him and then his teachers, they were, his teachers even pushed him farther. They told us, they said, you know what? We're going to teach him age, his age schoolwork, math even. Incredible. Math. And, you know, and the teacher, Miss Bonnie, she'd go, okay, Hunter, two, and she'd show him two plus two equals, and she'd say, does it equal? You gave him yeah. opportunity, mm -hmm. and he would answer. He would get hundreds on math tests all That's the time. That's incredible. We'd put them on the refrigerator. Yeah, because the, the child was cognitive. And what that means is he understood exactly what you were saying. It's just that he, physically, he could not show you. He and could not smile. He could not swallow, He could, but he could blink. Mm -hmm. And eventually, obviously, he was taught to blink three times for I love you. And, well, you know, I don't even think we taught him. He just did it one time. It wasn't like we had to teach him. He, we would say it, and he, you know, and then he blinked back. It was like, oh, oh my goodness, my that was the most goodness. amazing thing. But as he continued to get sick, he did eventually lose his ability to blink. Um, and so much was involved with that, and that was hard because he was even more trapped in his body. And But... For those years that he was able to do those things, it was just incredible.